the British Second Army is hot on the heels of the enemy in southern Holland. The Nazis now have little but a toehold on the scalp. They are retreating west of the River Maas. Mine-sweeping tanks clear the way for the Allied assault on Hertogenbosch. Hidden Nazi machine gun posts and cottages are blasted. British Tommies find time to go to the rescue of civilians trapped in fallen shelters. Crocodile flamethrowers pour fire on the enemy. Now the Allies head for Schindel. In bitter town-to-town -town fighting, British and American forces are steadily grinding the enemy back on the drive to Free Holland. Allied planes ring the globe in the final round of the battle against the enemy. Over wild Burmese jungles, the British Sunderland flying boats ferry supplies. Chendits, more than 500 miles behind Japanese lines, depend on these transport planes. Rafts fitted with motors carry the supplies ashore to keep the famous Burmese fighting units going during the monsoon. Now the rafts bring back wounded fighters for an air trip to base hospital. These planes are saving countless lives in the worst of the world's battle areas. Down in the Indian Ocean, British aircraft carriers steam towards Sumatra for an assault on the port of Padang and nearby Emma Haven. Loading 500-pound bombs, the planes are readied for an assault on a big cement plant in Padang and Japanese ships at Emma Haven. Corsair and Barracuda planes roar into the sky. Navigators plot the carrier's course to meet the returning plane. Planes chalk up another success in the broad offensive against Japan. On the European front, the 8th Air Force is tearing apart the Nazi fortress and its supply line. Assaults like this are whittling down the Luftwaffe. Daily, the power of the Allies increases in warfare of the sky. Freedom comes back to Greece. A better day dawns for Athens, ancient birthplace of democracy. Three years ago, the British promised the people of Greece they would return. Today, they fulfill their pledge. Athens is free. The hold of the enemy on the Balkans is crumbling. While the Allies push north from the Mediterranean, the enemy is threatened in the rear by the Russians.
Here, the British forces dock at a small harbor near Piraeus. A few hours earlier, Greek partisans stormed the capital in a surprise attack. Now these Tommies, together with Polish troops and the Greek regular army, converge on Athens. The Greeks hail the men of the United Nations. This is a moment the people of Greece will never forget. gather round the Allied soldiers and hail the forces of liberation. The ancient Acropolis, high above Athens, and the modern soldiers of Greece and Britain fit in the same illustrious pattern. Looking at the Parthenon, built in 447 BC, the uniformed tourists of today symbolize centuries of man's struggle for freedom. Now Piraeus welcomes the Greek Prime Minister, George Papandreou. The Guard of Honor includes Allied soldiers and native guerrilla fighters. For three years, back in the mountains, the guerrillas have stabbed at the enemy. These men and the Prime Minister have fought in the same cause alongside the Allies. General Scobie commands the British forces in Greece. Everywhere, the people hail Papandreou in victory. The premier here pays tribute to the heroic dead. This is the Greek memorial to the unknown soldier of the last war. The soldiers of today carry on the same struggle for freedom as their fathers. A simple ceremony expresses the nation's hope for the future. Four girls in native costume carry their national flag to the Parthenon, and the Prime Minister follows on foot over a route dedicated for 2,000 years to liberty. For three years, the people of Greece have been fighting a ruthless invader. Today, Freedom returns to its ancient home. 